program. So before going to start our this technical session, there is a request for all the participants to switch in your video. So our honorable observer from ICSSR NERC is here with our group and he's monitoring all the program of this, uh, all the sessions. So all are requested to switch on your video. Thank you. Uh, I think Professor Zonsema sir is here with us now. Professor, Professor of Political Science in DCP College, Zurhat, a member of our organizing committee to initiate the session and introduce our honorable research person for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dependas. Good afternoon to all esteemed participants. Welcome to the 13th technical session. Professor H. John Sema, Dean School of Social Science, Hagerland University, Umami, delivered this lecture on the topic human rights in the Northeast with particular reference to Nagaland. Before his presentation, I want to introduce Dr. Sema, sir. Professor Sema presently is a Dean School of Management and Dean Faculty of Law, Nagaland University. He remained, remained as a head of the Department of Political Science for four tenure intervals. Professor Sema, under him, produced a, a PhD scholars, seven sole supervisors, two co-supervisors, and six scholars are working presently under his kindness. Published more than 20 articles in both national as well as international level. Articles are published uh, in both national and international levels as well as his journals and some of the edited books of his. Professor Sema delivered quite uh, several numbers of lectures in several universities as a visiting fellow and invited guest lecturer. Professor Sema also delivers lectures in refresher course and orientation course organized and sponsored by UGC by the different universities. He chaired as resource person in seminars and conferences organized by respective colleges and chaired as a technical session also. It's our pleasure to have you among us, sir. Now may I request you to deliver your valuable lecture on the topic, human rights in the Northwest with particular reference to Nagaland. Now it's over to you, sir. Most welcome. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for giving me time. Uh, the chairperson, Madam uh, Dresana Hajarika. Thank you so much. Also, sir. Dr. Dependa Das, uh, Secretary of America, for giving me time to speak on this uh, uh, seminar on uh, to virtually. Uh, in fact, uh, I have uh, just uh, prepared my uh, uh, speech. Uh, I have not just uh, exactly prepared uh, the topic, but I, have, I just want to have uh, two sections of my paper. Just uh, one will be on this uh, general uh, discussion and then the second uh, of my paper will be basically on this uh, the Nagaland. And so I just uh, want to give only this uh, comment before coming to this uh, woman rights on uh, Naga political issues and Naga political aspirations and you know, why this has been delayed. Um, but uh, before that, I just want to say that uh, as, uh, political aspiration and self-determination from the woman rights point of view. So here this, uh, uh, I just give a uh, one. I will go. Over, I'm not going to go very detailed because I will, uh, there there will be so many of the other speakers. They have already discussed with all the theoretical frameworks and all. So I'm just going to give a brief line. But uh, uh, before coming to my paper, unless I uh, discuss a little bit, that will not be uh, uh, even uh, the, what I'm going to speak. So here, this uh, and uh, basically, I'm going to speak on this uh, the three dimensions of uh, three generations of human rights, and my people will be basically on this the third generation of human rights. But uh, before coming to that, I'll just uh, give only a brief outline of the first and second uh, generation of human rights, and come into the third generation of human rights. Uh, so here, this uh, human rights is uh, issues in uh, uh, Northeast and uh, Nagaland. Uh, 
but I'm going to focus more of uh, Nagaland. Uh, human rights must uh, triumph over in human rights. It must be triumph over in human rights, but without the uh, struggles, injustice cannot be wished away. That's what uh, Justice uh, B. R. Krishna, your former Supreme Court, has uh, commanded on that. So human rights are generally defined as the rights which every human being is entitled to enjoy and to have protected the struggle for the recognition of human rights and the struggle against political, economic, social, and cultural oppression against injustice and inequalities have been integral part of the history of all human societies. So we have uh, seen that what is injustice that has been uh, committed in the past by the dominant against the minority, against the uh, weaker sections of the people. The origins of the contemporary uh, conception of uh, human rights can be traced to the periods of Renaissance, the new spirit of learning and a new period. And the letter of this uh, uh, enlightenment of which humanism may be said to the heart and soul of human rights. The revolutionary movement that emerged from the last quarter of 18th century to, the over, to overthrow the despotic and authoritarian political regimes made rights of men which they consider inalienable and sacred as the fundamental basis of the struggle as well as of the new order that they sought to build. The two most important declaration which inspired revolutionary movement the all over were the American Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration of the Rights of Men and Citizens. And the letter, the one that the uh, French Declaration has a marked universal character. It has gotten back all over the world. It, it may be useful to refer to a certain aspect of evolution of contemporary concept of human rights in terms of three generations of human rights. Now, just uh, the first generation of human rights are uh, those that were concerned mainly with the civil and political rights of the individual or the liberty-oriented rights. This uh, first generation of rights may be referred to this uh, American Declaration of Independence from Britain. Now, its always significance lies in the assertion that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So those are, this is, uh, this is considered as uh, first generation of uh, human rights that deal with civil and political rights. The second generation of human rights are those who can be uh, considered as uh, security oriented and provide for social, economic, and cultural. This is Social, economic, and cultural, they are considered more of positive in the nature and that they make it the duty of the state to ensure that these rights are realized. Is that uh, it is uh, they consider as one of the positive and it should be the duty of the state to realize these uh, human rights. Now, this, uh, the declaration, the, the universal declaration of human rights reflect the consensus on the principle which form the basis of the first and second generation of human rights can be referred to the French Declaration of the Rights of Men and Citizens.
as you all know about this, uh, how the French Revolution takes place and how the despotic uh, rules that has been uh, uh, rule over this, uh, the, this uh, by the, this uh, French uh, authority. So here, this, uh, this declaration was truly international in this chapter, in this chapter and inspired revolutionary and democratic movement in almost every country of the world, particularly in this uh, uh, Europe, Afri America, even uh, Asia and Africa, that has uh, shook the whole world. So this is uh, considered as one of the most important uh, second generation of uh, human rights, but uh, the second generation of human rights, it is not only this economic, but also uh, it includes with both civil and political rights. The third generation of human rights are relatively recent origin. Now, this, uh, this is a, just a recent origin. This includes uh, environment, cultural, and development rights. Now, they are concerned with this, uh, the third generation of rights. It is a concern not uh, with the individual rights, but concerned with this uh, the rights of the groups and peoples. And so this, uh, they are then that of the individuals. And these rights includes the rights of, the rights to self determinations and the right to self development. Now, the developing countries, the developing countries that is that mostly the third world countries have played a leading role in bringing about international consensus on these rights. Now, the Declaration of the, on the Rights to Development adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1986 is the most important example of these rights. Now, since the adoption of this uh, Universal Declarations on this uh, third generation of human rights, there have been many controversies regarding the question of which rights, which rights are more important than which rights. So the rights, they talk about the controversy that whether the rights of uh, the civil and political rights and economic and other rights, or is that this, uh, the development rights and indigenous rights are more important? That this has been the Questions. Now here, there's uh, the representatives of the developed countries. In the debate that uh, the representative of the developed countries had been asserting that civil and political rights are more important, are more important than economic, social, and cultural rights. Whereas the third world countries emphasize that the importance of economic, social, and cultural rights, and the rights to development are equally important to other human rights, and they are indivisible from that of civil and political rights or other, and other rights as well. Now, here the, the Vienna Declaration in 1993 issued after the conference on indigenous uh, 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 conference, the rights of indigenous peoples, in which are representatives of 171 countries and hundreds of non-governmental organizations they participated. They have unambiguously affirmed that all human rights all human rights are universal, indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. They say that uh, no rights are in can exist in uh, isolations, and no rights can be isolated from other rights. But they say that all rights are universal, and no rights can be ignored. So here they unambiguously affirm that all human rights are universal, 
indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. So it has also been affirmed that democracy is the sole grantor, sole grantor of individual rights, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural, and also collective rights within states and also within the community of the states. So here this, uh, the third world countries are pleading and they have been asserting that uh, uh, democracy, of course, that is the unanimous, unanimous to all uh, the countries, whether they are advanced country or the third world country, they all uh, agree that democracy is the sole calendar of all these human rights. Now, the Universal Declaration has also influenced the constitutions and legal system of many countries, uh, many countries of those who were, those who were signatories to the covenants and conventions of human rights, they are obliged to implement them, although, although it is not legally binding on them, but it is morally, it is morally, but morally it should be the responsibility of the government, those who are the signatories of this UN covenants and conventions, to protect and promote all these human rights. Now, these convenances can be enforced if necessary through the intervention of the courts. If somebody petitions, this is how there's, uh, the, uh, the human rights can be, uh, you know, popularized, can be protected. Now, that's on the principle and declaration of UN Human Rights and International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights, which was adopted by the General as UN General Assembly of the United Nations on 16 December 1966, and that came into force on 23rd March 1976, the part one and article one and two three uh, of this uh, UN declarations my, here my presentation is just one to focus on this, particularly this, uh, this uh, political aspirations and the right to self-determination to these indigenous peoples. And so here there's, uh, I'm just going to speak on this uh, political aspirations and the right of self-determination of unique nationalities. Now, here, part one and part uh, part one, article one stated that well, the UN Charter say that all people have the right to self determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely proceed to economic, social, and cultural developments. It also stated that in article three that the state parties to the present covenant, including those who have responsibility for the administration of non-self-governing and trust territories shall promote the realization of the right of self-determination and shall respect the rights in conformity with the provisions of the Charter of the United Nations. So here there's, uh, there's uh, the Article 1 uh, of the United, uh, uh, Charter of the United Nations that have, that all these indigenous people have the right for self-determination. And also those non-government, uh, self-government institutions also, people, uh, countries who have a responsibility for administration of non-self-governing and trust territories shall also promote the realization of the right of self-determination of this indigenous people. Now, we'll refer in this uh, human rights, particularly to the Naga political issues. Now, here, this, uh, despite the Indus recognition to 
Naga history and the culture from that of the mainstream Indian history, but how and how these both Naga political issues get to be realized. This is one thing just I would like to uh, speak on that. So here, uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, very uh, deeply, but I'm just going to give only this, uh, the brief points that I would like to uh, say, and then I will discuss later. Here, this uh, the, with the Naga political consciousness and development that starts after this, uh, the formation of the Naga Club in 1918, and later on, there's the representation memorandum to the Simon Commission on January, 10 January 1929. The Naga political movement, the Naga political consciousness developed since then. Now, this, uh, after that, uh, the Naga, uh, uh, Naga National Group so formed, uh, Naga National Council was formed, and they have been started uh, Naga political issues. Here it is, and uh, because of that, the Nagas, they have declared their independence one day ahead of this, uh, before the, uh, in the declared its independence on 15th of, uh, of course, 1947. Now, after this, uh, uh, this uh, more than four decades of India's Nagas uh, struggle for the self determination, I will not going to speak on this, uh, but I just want to speak why this, uh, uh, we this went on this. Uh, as a student of political science, I want to give my uh, angle of uh, presentations. So, here, this. Uh, after four, or more than four decades of armed confrontation between Indian armies and the Naga militants, the government of India realized that Naga issues cannot be solved through military might and confrontations, but it requires political will and it can be solved only too politically. So, based on that understanding, the government of India also initiated there's a ceasefire uh, agreement between the two groups, between the government of India and this uh, NSNI. And so since then, this peace process has been started on 1st August, 1997. Now, during this uh, political dialogue, the government of India and its inter interlocutor the one who is the mediator between the government of India and this, uh, the NSNI, they have been blamed. They have been played with the Naga sentiments. And they have been used all this uh, technical charcoal to interpret the, and the dialogue with the constitution and also, you know, just a competency, whatever they have been uh, doing that. So now what they have been using that some of the technical charcoal that is half ambiguous and is not applicable. Now they, they use the word share sovereignty and suprastate, which is practically not applicable in the context of Indian situation, but just to confuse, but just to confuse the people and the Nakas who are part of a negotiating parties. Now here, as a student of uh, political science, and also uh, the, one of the men, uh, the observer, here this, when we just, and the government of India fully knowing well, knowing well, but they use this kind of a technical jargon just to confuse the people is that, when we talk about the shared sovereignty, the real concept of a sovereignty is that it is indivisible. It cannot be shared. Now, how this, they are using the word that shared sovereignty that has been trying to confuse with the people. Another one is that they use the word suprastate. Now, the, super, the concept of the suprastate is a superfluous words. And that is the suprastate is uh, only applied to the case of the diplomatic immunity to those who have diplomatic 
credentials, not R words that is not applied to each and every, even to, to the diplomatic stuffs. So when we are looking back all these kind of things, and also when a government of India has been met very clear that the negotiation with the NSN and the Naga groups, particularly on the issue of particularly on the issue of integration of the Naga areas that has been opposed by these other neighboring states. So now here, when the other neighboring state has made it very clear that they will not allow this the territory to be part of, uh, to be part away from their states, how the question of the word that suppressed it has been applied just to confuse the people because this uh, if the nagas of manipur or the nagas of assam or Arnachal, if they want to apply the naga customary naga -ish political uh, you know kind of government to be applied in the case of uh, manipur or assam or uh, Arnachal, i don't think that the uh, Arnachal people or assamese or any other state will agree to that point of it. And so then, why this uh, kind of a concept that has been discussed, just to yeah. progress in it and just to delay or to prolong. So that is uh, some kind that uh, the government of India that has been uh, trying to distort the legal terminologies and trying to prolong the peace talks without any concrete outcome. Is that is that also not uh, because it is uh, when you are playing with the sentiments and emotions of the people, is that is also a violation of human rights in one way or other. Now, after more than uh, 70 rounds of talks between the government of India and the NSA and I, the framework agreement was signed between on the third of course on 2015 between the government of uh, India and NSA and IA. Now, even after six years, even after six years, no solution is in sight. Now, instead, instead it creates more controversy on the issue of, on the issue of flag and constitution, which has not mentioned or it has not been uh, referred anywhere in the framework agreement. And but the blame game started between the two groups. But why? Why the government of in India has not been spelled out and has not been declared open to the Naga populations and to the Naga people that this is the actual agreement by the to between the two government. But but the parties are trying to trying to hide from the public uh, domains. Is just is that the policy to go for prolong the case and procrastination? Is that uh, is that uh, why this is a done that? Uh, now this is another part of the story. Now where is this uh, Naga national political groups? The other factions the seven other factions which have started a political dialogue with the government of India after the post-framework agreement was signed. These NNPGs have signed a great position. They have a great position before this, the full negotiation start. They have started with a great position that based on these uh, points, we will uh, met negotiation between the government of India and Naga national political groups. And uh, so they have uh, made the agreed position on November 17, November 1970. And that was culminated on 31st October 2019 with agreed points that they said they say that uh, to, for settlement, uh, there's uh, all unresolved matters all unresolved matters shall be pursued through democratic political process post political solutions. They say that 
whatever remaining, whether it is constitution, whether it is uh, black, or whether it is uh, uh, integration of all Naga inhabited areas, or whether it is uh, the question of sovereignty, that can be discussed and that can the, this will be proceed till all these are achieved. Now, the deadline was also, they have met in a deadline that uh, the 31st uh, October 2019 will be the last date for negotiation to both the parties, that is negotiation between the government of India and NSNI, and also between this uh, government of India and NNPG, Naga uh, National Political Groups that uh, constitute the seven uh, factions. Now here, this, uh, after this, uh, the third August framework agreement, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he came to the Nagaland on 1st December uh, 2015 in this uh, Hornbill Festival, where he has made an announcement has made an announcement that uh, this uh, the Vexit Naga political issue that uh, uh, within 18 months, the, he said that uh, the Naga political uh, solution will be met within 18 months. Now, from uh, 15, the, uh, 2000, uh, from 1st December 2015, he see that within 18 months, the Nago political solutions will be met, but uh, no solution has been in the sight. We cannot see anything. And even before this uh, 2018 election, assembly, uh, state assembly election, well, they were campaigning the BJP political parties. They have even said that there's a, uh, election for solutions. They say that if BJP parties come to power, they will see to that that issue, there will be solutions. But so far, we have not seen any solution, even, in the, you know, even after uh, three years. Now we can just see what is, uh, why this government of India, is it uh, all of this, uh, the Naga people, or is it the government of India is, has, does not have the will to solve this uh, Naga political issues. Now, this amount to psychological torture and violation of non rights. Now, this, uh, in many ways, this uh, government of India has been given, give, been given false promises and put undue stress on the Naga publics. The, na, because uh, many of the Naga publics, whether sovereignty, whether integrations, or whether, in whatever way, they want that solution should come at the earliest. Now, hear that. When you see that uh, 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 there's uh, Naga political issues, you can we can also see that uh, uh, the India is also a signatory to the UN Charter of Women Rights. But when it comes to the practical implementation on the ground, the government of India is uh, not uh, willing to implement them in letter and in spirit. This is a uh, but the government of India always followed the policy of procrastination. Followed the policy of a procrastination, playing with the passions and sentiments of the people. And also the government of India also played with the policy that there should be the let, let the rival groups among the Naga underground factions let them eliminate one among themselves. Let them eliminate among themselves so that 
they will weaken among themselves and they will not be a force to reckon to fight against the Indian. So that is uh, one of these uh, the, uh, policy that has been played by the government of India. But otherwise, if they are, has the will, the, the people of the Nagas, they're willing that any solutions, if that is coming, and if they uh, explain to the people and if they bring to the domain of the public, the Naga people are willing to see that solutions should come at the earliest. Now, another violations, we are coming to that. I'm just going to uh, combine that. Now, another violation of human rights is that when the peace process has already started, peace has already started and initiated and the dialogue already started. Now, the law and order problems, the law and order problem is already improved and normalcy is restored in the Naga inhabited areas. But the government of India is maintaining the double standard by imposing that there is a uh, by pleading that pleading that there is a security threat and they have enforced disturb area act in the Naga inhabited areas and also impose this armed forces special power act in Naga areas and not only in Nagaland but also in this uh, Assam part of Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, in Manipur. Now here is uh, on this uh, on this pretext, what the government of India is doing that, well, this process has been on. They also use this ASPA under the protection of Disturbed Area Act, and they are arresting any people with mere suspicion, with mere suspicion, they arrest them and they torture and they try to extract information in order to see that how they will able to capture all the Daga underground and their supporters and their sympathizers. This is how they are just uh, trying that. And on the basis of that, uh, under the protection of the ASPA, they will just arrest any person with even the innocent people with mere suspicion if they have any connections or any relations with any uh, of the underground. And based on that, the governor of Nagaland has also issued an order to the chief minister of Nagaland and to the chief secretary that they should issue the letter to the state government employees that any of the Nagaland state employees has got any relation with a, or any connection with any of the underground, they should uh, put in writing and then the format has been issued to many of uh, uh, the state, uh, to the state employees, uh, not the many, but to, to all the state employees. But uh, the chief minister and the office has been kept for some time, but uh, under pressure of the governor of Nagaland, I think they must have issued to all the state government employees. This is also another violation of human rights. How we will go and say that just because somebody is related to me or somebody, of course, on my part, there is no one as uh, on the record, there is no uh, related no one of my relations are with the underground, but here, this kind of uh, order that has been issued, this is also very much in violation of human rights. Now, there's armed forces, the armed forces that has been uh, torturing the, even the innocent people, just under the protection of uh, ASPA Act, even if they uh, acted, excessively, or even if they uh, uh, just, uh, acted, uh, if they committed any kind of uh, crimes, 
they are they, there is the immunity and they can be uh, they, they they cannot be prosecuted under the protection of this uh, aspa this is uh, another one very uh, you know uh, uh, one that is uh, uh, the token and the law that is against this uh, human rights. Now, on the issue of this uh, ASPA, when you see that uh, the, 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 the Naxalite, the Naxalite activity that is uh, in the central, uh, the mainland India, the government of India and the main, uh, mainstream politicians and even the armies, they say that they should not deploy and requisition the surface of the armies to combat and to crush the Naxalite just because they are our own brothers. But my question here is that, my question here is that, are the Northeastern peoples, are the Northeastern peoples, from Assam, the Alphas, or the Manipur militants, or the Naga militants, are they not the Nagas? Are they not the Indians? Are they are the alliance? Is that this kind of a racial discriminations against this the Northeastern people with the same kind of issues that is? confirmed in with India, but they do not want to use the armed forces to combat with the Naxalite, but they want that armed forces, ASPA should not be lifted and should not be withdrawn from the Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir, but it should not be applied to the case of the Naxalite and to the mainland India. So this is what I just like to uh, put forward to the to the uh, members. Now here another one is that we have when we see that uh, the uh, political aspiration, the indigenous peoples, you know whether it is in uh, Assam, you have so many other groups. Whether it is in Mizoram, whether it is in uh, uh, particularly this uh, Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh, you know we have so many uh, uh, human rights issues and uh, problems. We are facing that lots of uh, problems uh, that is uh, confronting us. But uh, the government of India is just only trying to see that isolate the Northeastern people, particularly on this, when you come to this and uh, political issues. And also another issue that is really going to confront and that is really going to uh, change the democratic field Democratic feature of the Nordisan people is that uh, this, uh, uh, and particularly to the Nordisan region, is that uh, Citizen Amendment Act that has been passed in the parliament. Now, if that is implemented in the Nordisk, I'm sure that is going to affect the democratic uh, demographic feature of. Northeastern regions, because uh, you'll find that uh, there will be millions of uh, people, particularly from the neighboring state, neighboring country that is going to have an influx like a flood, and that is going to overhaul or the submerge to the Northeastern regions. Now you see that uh, here that is, uh, uh, it will have an impact particularly on this, uh, not only the uh, population ratio, the demographic uh, feature, but also it will have an impact on socioeconomic and political scenario of the regions. Because, you know, we all know that the tribal populations will be submerged, overcome by these millions of immigrants uh, from the neighboring countries. Now, which will affect the interpolitical system as well. Now here, you can just see this uh, the example of Tripura. We all know that uh, Tripura was the main, uh, this is uh, dominated by the tribals pre-independence pre period. 
and the outsiders were only 15% of the population. But now, the Tripura uh, indigenous peoples have been converted into minority groups because of overflow of these outsiders. Now, this, uh, the indigenous uh, minority tribals, their rights will be throttled by the outsiders, which is uh, going to be the serious, serious violations of this indigenous human rights. So here, we, when we talk about indigenous uh, human rights, whether you talk about this, uh, the political rights, social economics, cultural. Now, the most important question here is that their lands, even in their own lands, you have the right to, pro to protect their lands and their territories. And the land is the heart and soul and the survival of the tribal peoples and to all other people as well. But when it comes to this, uh, particularly to the tribals, now, if this is implemented, it's going to be an serious issue, not only to this uh, Nagaland, but also all the northeastern regions. Now, you all know that the Assam is also having the millions of and the lots of people that coming from outside. And a day is going to come that we will be the minority in our own land. And that is going to be a, 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 an issue. And there will be human rights violations and every one of them. Here, I just want to add that now, coming to this uh, Nagaland context is that the Naga political issues, if that is not that is not the soul at the early, that is going to have the problems and is going to happen in the other more distant states, particularly to the state of Manipur, with the state of Assam and the state of uh, uh, Arunachal Pradesh. And that is why this, uh, if the government of um, India has a will, they will have to tell even to the NSNI group that these are the terms that we have been agreed to and it should be, have been met properly. But why? The government of India is also not making public to the people of Nagaland, but making as you know, still it is still hiding from the government of the public. And the people have been making the case in what is inside of this issue that's still hanging on. So this is why I see that this also when you are not violating physically, but when you are uh, making a, a stress, an emotional set and sentiment on the people, it is also a violation of human rights. This is just what I would like to share with the members. And I, I, I want to have uh, many things, but uh, I just want if any questions are there, I would like to discuss. And that's why I'm trying to shorten my uh, discussion uh, with, uh, presentation to uh, the members. Well, thank you so much, sir. I, on behalf of Center for Ethnic Studies and Research, my thanks and gratitude for accepting our invitation. And as sir has uh, said that he wants to conclude now and the session is open for observation and discussion. It is 3.21 now, so we have got a little bit of time. Uh, 